All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are very pleased to have Dr. Jason Matheny today to talk to us about emerging technologies and international security. Um, I just want to say that this talk is being sponsored by the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Institute of Technology and by the um, research program on emerging technologies and international security. So this is part of an ongoing speaker series and we hope to continue this throughout the semester. Um, before we turn things over, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Jason Matheny is a founding director of Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Previously, he was assistant director of national intelligence um, and director of IARPA, responsible for the development of breakthrough technologies for the U.S. intelligence community. Um, before that, he worked at Oxford University, the World Bank, the Applied Physics Laboratory, the Center for Biosecurity, and Princeton University, and was the co-founder of two biotech companies. Dr. Matheny is a member of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence and the National Academy's Intelligence Community Studies Board. Um, is a recipient of the Intelligence Community's Award for Individual Achievement in Science and Technology, the National Intelligence Superior Service Medal, and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and was named one of Foreign Policy's Top 50 Global Thinkers. He served on various White House committees related to AI, biosecurity, high-performance computing, and quantum information science. He co-led the National AI R&D Strategic Plan released by the White House in 2016 and was a member of the White House Select Committee on AI created in 2018. He holds a PhD in Applied Economics from Johns Hopkins and an MPH from Johns Hopkins as well, an MBA from Duke and a BA from University of Chicago. So we are incredibly lucky to have um, Dr. Matheny here to talk about uh, emerging technologies, and I will now turn things over. Um, and then uh, just a sort of brief um, logistical question or uh, announcement. If you have questions to ask, we'll turn to a Q&A after the presentation. You'll see on the right-hand side of your um, screen a Q&A section. So please put any questions that you might have in there um, as opposed to the chat. Let's try to keep the questions in the Q&A function and then I will go through those when we get to that uh, point in the talk. So thank you so much. Um, turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor Jordan, for inviting me uh, today. And it's, it's great to be with all of you. I have uh, two goals. Uh, the first is to describe some of the security implications of emerging technologies, just sort of giving a sample of, of those issues, which is uh, by no means comprehensive. And then the second is to try to convince some of you to work on these topics, as I think they're, they're really important. Um, some of them keep me up at night, and there are surprisingly few people uh, working on addressing these issues. Uh, so I have maybe 20 minutes of remarks, and then I think we'll we'll move uh, quickly into Q&A. Um, and Chris, if you don't mind, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with, with synthetic biology because it serves as an example of why you don't need to start as either a technologist or a national security expert to work at the intersection of these two topics. Um, I started my career in global health as an epidemiologist, and I spent about a decade working on uh, controlling malaria and tuberculosis and HIV. And I, I moved into national security um, sort of by accident. Uh, in 2002, uh, the first virus was synthesized from scratch on a, on a DARPA project, just as proof of principle. Um, and at the time, I was working in India um, on a, a health project, and the people around me uh, who I worked with had been part of the eradication campaign for smallpox. The reason that probably most of you don't have smallpox vaccination scars on your arms is because these folks were successful. They eradicated this disease that was killing on the order of 4 million people per year. And their first reaction to a virus being synthesized from scratch was crap. Uh, all that work, you know, the decades that it took us to eradicate smallpox could be undone if somebody could synthesize uh, pox virus from scratch. Uh, 
And I started to worry about that. We kind of did initial analysis to try to figure out how much would it cost for, uh, for smallpox or something similar to be synthesized. And it looked like the costs would probably drop uh, exponentially over time and, and become pretty accessible um, sometime in the 2020s. So I ended up moving from working on traditional public health to working in, in national security, um, basically cold calling uh, the intelligence community, saying that I was worried about this, and then started uh, working in, in national security. So I'm sort of an existence proof uh, that you can meander your way into working in this field uh, without having planned it. And the developments in, in this field have actually made me more worried uh, than I was in 2002. The progress has been exponential in our ability to both sequence and synthesize DNA. That has lots of upside potential. Uh, we'll be able to do extraordinary things for human medicine, agriculture, energy, materials, uh, but it also has a lot of downside risks, um, such as uh, the ability for a single individual to synthesize uh, viruses that are capable of killing millions of people or the prospect of laboratory accidents. The graph on the top right of this uh, slide shows the costs of reading DNA since the Human Genome Project started. And the first whole human genome cost about a billion dollars to sequence. Um, now it costs $1,000 to sequence, so a million-fold reduction in 20 years. And this is in part due to Moore's law uh, of semiconductors, which we'll talk about in a minute, because sequencing is largely a computational problem. Uh, but it's also due to improvements in the sequencing equipment that are needed to make the process more automated. A second key trend in synthetic biology is the reduction in gene synthesis costs, that is, the ability to write DNA. Um, which has seen a 1,000-fold reduction in the last 20 years. So not as dramatic as sequencing, but it's made practical the de novo synthesis of organisms and more frequently the synthesis of individual genes that can then be inserted uh, into existing organisms. Um, a final trend that's worth highlighting is uh, the means of, of editing genomes. It's now substantially cheaper to edit an existing genome than to synthesize a new one. Um, one editing technique called CRISPR was the foundation for the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry uh, that was announced last year, and it wasn't the first technique for gene editing, but in a period of about five years, it became uh, the most commonly used and has decreased the cost per accurate edit by a factor of, of 100. So these three tools, sequencing, synthesis, and editing, in combination make biology into an engineering discipline. Um, cells can now be used as factories. You can instruct those factories to do useful things like producing fuels or medicines, uh, or you can modify them to prevent bad things such as malaria. Um, one of the characteristics of biology that makes it a really powerful engineering system is self-replication. Um, so you can make very efficient factories when the factories themselves can self-replicate. Uh, this has a downside risk. I mean, nuclear bombs make me nervous, uh, but one positive thing you can say about nuclear bombs is that they don't self-replicate. If you leave a nuclear warhead uh, in a warehouse and come back a month later, there's still only one nuclear warhead there. Uh, that's not true for biology. Um, another characteristic of biology is that organisms evolve. Uh, this can be a useful process since it produced most of the life uh, that we consider valuable. Um, uh, but it can also give rise to other things that we don't care for, such as antibiotic resistance. Um, gain of function is a certain kind of directed evolution in which the goal is to increase the virulence, transmissibility, or lethality of an organism. And this has led to a substantial controversy in biology in the last several years, sparked by two separate labs demonstrating that there was a way to create highly transmissible forms of bird flu. Uh, the work was actually supported by the National Institutes of Health, by the US federal government. And the argument for that research was that we'll better understand the mechanisms of infection and the genes responsible for, uh, for viral uh, transmissibility or lethality um, by um, increasing the function of those viruses. Uh, but this also raised a lot of concerns that you're giving away the blueprints for a biological weapon 
uh, by doing this type of research. Gene drive is another controversial application of synthetic biology in which a gene is, is inserted in such a way to ensure that it's inherited by all offspring. And in rapidly reproducing species, this means that a gene can quickly become ubiquitous. Um, a positive application of, of gene drives is to make mosquitoes incapable of transmitting malaria. Um, a malevolent application of a gene drive would be to make all pollinating insects die off, effectively decimating uh, many parts of agriculture. So I, I think that biology uh, will pose some of the most serious challenges to national security due not only to natural disease outbreaks like COVID, uh, but also to laboratory accidents, of, of which um, there are unfortunately many that happen each year, often quite serious, um, or the intentional misuse of biology. There's substantial offense dominance in biology. It's, it's really cheap to do a lot of, of damage and very expensive to prevent it. As one example, a few years ago, uh, a couple of biologists showed that they could synthesize a pox virus for $100,000. Uh, using only commercially available tools and techniques. So if someone decided to synthesize and release a smallpox virus, uh, it would kill many millions of people. Uh, and it, it is practical today. Basically, someone can create an arsenal of hydrogen bombs for the cost of uh, you know, one year's salary. And I don't think there's anything comparably cost effective in destructiveness in the world. Um, uh, and there's also no cheap, cheap way of, of addressing it. Producing a new vaccine costs on the order of, of $3 billion per new vaccine um, and then more to, to distribute it. Um, so the sort of ratio of developing and uh, the cost of developing a defense to the cost of developing an offense here is on the order of 30,000 to one, uh, which, um, which we have to find a way of shrinking. So governing this technology is, I think, going to be one of our biggest security challenges over the next few decades. Uh, Chris, next slide, please. Um, microelectronics is one of the most fundamental technologies um, that I'll describe. Is it, it's really the foundation for most other modern technologies. Uh, it, it's embedded in everything from modern computers to uh, modern cars. Um, to most other devices that are, um, that are useful in modern society rely to some degree on, on semiconductors that form microelectronics. And progress in this entire area has really depended on our ability to manufacture smaller and smaller features that are only nanometers in size. And the, the challenge of depositing material at that resolution is analogous to standing on the Earth and shooting an arrow into an apple that's sitting on the surface of the moon. Um, and that's what we do trillions of times every day at semiconductor manufacturing plants uh, in a few different countries in the world. Um, for the last several decades, we've increased this resolution at an exponential rate, doubling the resolution every couple of years. And this trend is known as, as Moore's Law, which is that graph on the top right. The y-axis is logarithmic, uh, which is why this graph uh, is linear. Um, but the, the doubling time of every two years has meant really that our ability to produce a certain amount of computing for a certain cost uh, has doubled every couple of years, uh, which is a really extraordinary trend that's, that's continued for decades. The end of Moore's Law has been predicted for many years. Um, and there's been strong economic forces that continue to push it. Um, first, it was the space program in the 1960s. Uh, NASA and its Apollo program wa was the primary consumer of, of all integrated circuits, really of, of most semiconductors on the planet. Then it was supercomputers, then it was personal computers, then it was video games as the primary consumer. And now it's AI, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I'll show a few graphs and other technologies that, that continue to look like Moore's Law, and many of them derive directly from the exponential improvements in microelectronics. At the bottom of the slide is a picture of one of the most important machines on the planet right now. Um, it's called an extreme ultraviolet photolithography machine, and it's the tool that's used to make 
the smallest features on the most advanced microelectronics. And there are two really interesting features of the microelectronics market uh, that involves these sorts of machines. The first is that the manufacturing is highly concentrated. Only three companies in the world, uh, TSMC, which is in Taiwan, Samsung, which is in Korea, and Intel, which is in the United States, produce the most advanced chips. Um, also, only three countries, the US, Japan, and the Netherlands, produce the equipment like that extreme ultraviolet machine that's essential for manufacturing those chips. So in foreign policy, this is important because it gives the US and a couple of its allies an enormous amount of leverage over modern technology. Um, for example, China imports over $300 billion a year in microelectronics, uh, more than it imports in oil. Um, and most of those imports are from Taiwan, uh, and most of those imports rely on equipment that the US, Netherlands, and Japan control. So that not only makes Taiwan very important geopolitically, uh, but it also gives the United States and allies a lot of leverage over this supply chain that's very important to China um, and which the United States has started to exercise as a tool of, of geopolitical influence. Uh, next slide, please. So AI is a general purpose technology with broad applications that's also seen a lot of progress over the last several decades. And this has really been due to three enablers, um, some mathematical uh, breakthroughs that were made in the mid 1980s and sort of waiting for there to be a sufficient amount of data and compute to throw at this new type of machine learning uh, called deep learning. Um, so it sort of had to wait for the arrival of, of data uh, and compute uh, to be sufficiently cheap in order to train uh, massive neural nets. Um, the graph on the top right shows the amount of compute that's been used in leading edge AI systems. And since 2012, when neural nets won a major AI competition, the amount of AI compute has doubled every three to four months. So even faster than Moore's law. And this is because companies are willing to throw ever larger amounts of money at compute to solve hard problems. You know, many billions of dollars um, spent just on the computing um, to support AI at companies like Google and, and Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple. Um, AI is going to create a lot of opportunities commercially, um, you know, everything from, from speech recognition to autonomous vehicles. It will also create a lot of opportunities for national security, um, especially in automating the analysis that's used in national intelligence for things like imagery or intercepted communications. Um, historically, the intelligence community has been one of the earliest adopters of, of AI. But we're also seeing AI now um, being embedded in, in physical systems or being used in the maintenance or logistics around physical systems. AI creates a number of challenges, and it turns out that there's a fundamental vulnerability in those deep learning systems that we don't yet know how to fix. It's baked into the math, um, which is that they suffer from optical illusions that affect only these deep learning systems. Um, the picture on the bottom right shows how this optical illusion works. If you take an image of, say, a macaw, and you add some pixelated noise in the middle, you end up with this picture on the right. And uh, to, to me, at least, the picture is indistinguishable from the one on the left. But the AI now thinks with 89% probability that it's a picture of a bookcase. Um, this injection of noise or sort of digital camouflage is called an adversarial example. And you can do this to real world objects. You can disguise them so that uh, they don't appear any different to human eyes, but they now get misclassified by machine learning systems. Um, you can imagine various uses of this sort of uh, digital camouflage or digital denial and deception. Uh, we already see real world examples in which um, objects are intentionally being hidden from uh, intelligence community uh, overhead systems, for example. Um, AI has other problems. It's often a black box. We don't yet know how to certify the safety of most AI systems, their risk to privacy, their possible risks of bias and discrimination if the training data aren't carefully managed. And because of the dependence on large amounts of compute, a very small number of companies 
and, um, and universities can actually afford to do leading edge work uh, because it's quite expensive. Then there's a long-term concern, which is really understudied right now, that advances in AI will cause a decrease in strategic stability. Um, as one example, Russia has historically been interested in automating various forms of automation into its nuclear command and control systems because it's been concerned about the possibility of a decapitating first strike. Uh, there's also concern that some combination of small, stealthy, autonomous weapons combined with advanced sensing might pose a credible threat to second strike nuclear systems such as uh, nuclear submarines. Um, it's, it's clear that there's a lot of anxiety um, about the way in which AI will affect long-term strategic stability, including possible escalation risks. Um, and if, if any of you all are thinking about, you know, thesis topics, uh, this is one that I think is really rich with potential. It needs a lot of work um, because a lot depends on it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, quantum computing um, involves computers that exploit two quantum phenomena. Um, superposition, which is the ability for a quantum bit or, or a qubit uh, to simultaneously maintain more than one state at the same time, uh, which is completely uh, counterintuitive um, for our classical mechanical brains. Um, and an, a second property called entanglement, which is the ability for two or more qubits to share their states uh, at distance. Um, in the early 1980s, there were a few different physicists, um, including Richard Feynman, who hypothesized that combining these two phenomena could allow one to create a computer that had special properties. Uh, it was unclear what the uh, most useful application for such a machine would be um, until 1994, when a mathematician named Peter Shore discovered that if you had a very large quantum computer, uh, you could efficiently factor large numbers. And this is important because most current encryption depends on the difficulty of factoring. Um, if factoring becomes an easy math problem, then many existing encryption techniques are no longer secure, including the ones that we use for most of our um, you know, online commerce. Um, there are other potential applications of, of quantum computing, including um, simulating molecules so that you can design better chemicals, uh, solving hard optimization problems, uh, including ones that uh, are involved in, in machine learning. Um, but there hasn't yet been a demonstration of doing something useful with a quantum computer that you could not do with a regular computer at substantially lower cost. Uh, this sort of evidence of quantum supremacy um, is one that's probably in the future. We just don't know how far out. Um, right now, there are a bunch of hero experiments that involve a few dozen qubits, most of which are used to correct the errors that you get from other qubits. Um, to do valuable things, you'd need several thousand qubits, um, which are error corrected. But the difficulties in error correction increase with the addition of every qubit. Um, still, this is an area that is uh, going to be contested in the future, in part because the U.S. will need to decide how quickly to roll out new forms of encryption that are resistant to quantum attacks. And these forms of encryption exist, but they're um, computationally costly. Uh, you have to do more work in order to encrypt. So there will be decisions about when you really roll out uh, these forms of encryption at scale. There's also an interesting strategic question about who will benefit most from quantum computing's applications to crypt analysis. Uh, that is the decoding of, um, of encrypted data. Uh, be because large-scale quantum computers are likely to be introduced after quantum resistant encryption is, is already widely deployed, the countries that are likely to benefit the most from quantum decryption would be the countries whose policies allow them to store intercepted foreign communication for decades. That is, they would use the quantum computer to decrypt uh, historical uh, intercepted communications. And the U.S. by policy doesn't do that. Um, so it's possible that the U.S. actually won't gain as much um, from quantum decryption as other countries uh, would, which raises some sort of interesting policy questions about how quickly should we push on sort of the offensive side versus the defensive side of, of quantum computing. Uh, Chris, next slide, please. So 
space is useful because it, um, it's high above us and many useful activities require an unimpeded line of sight between you and something else. Um, if you want to see something, you need a line of sight. If you want to send or receive a radio signal, you need a line of sight. When um, in 1945, Arthur C. Clarke published the idea of putting communication satellites in orbit, uh, and unfortunately not for him, at least unfortunately not patenting the idea, um, he was really thinking about lines of sight. Um, he was thinking, how do we um, have a clear line to multiple points on the surface of the Earth uh, so that you can more efficiently uh, communicate information? So if you have enough things in space, you have lots of lines of sight, um, but putting things into space is costly. Um, for about 50 years, it's cost on order $10,000 per kilogram to launch objects into orbit. Um, there's now newer technologies that are reducing that cost, including reusability, um, which might eventually yield a tenfold reduction in, in the cost of putting a kilogram into orbit. But probably a more significant trend is the miniaturization of payloads uh, to go into orbit. So, for example, we've reduced uh, maybe launch costs um, by, I don't know, three or four X, maybe eventually 10 X. But microelectronic weight per unit performance has decreased by a factor of one million uh, in the last 50 years. So one example of the benefit of, of miniaturization is CubeSats, um, an example of which is, is pictured on this slide. Um, there are limits to what you can do in a box this size, but there are incredibly clever things, um, such as you know, unfurling antennas that used uh, springed measuring tape, um, or using uh, ion spray electric propulsion that can maneuver these CubeSats at very low energy. Um, the democratization of space using things like CubeSats means that there's a growing number of objects uh, currently on order 10,000 objects in LEO alone, which is likely uh, to increase maybe by a factor of 10 within the next decade, which presents in a lot of space traffic management problems. Um, fortunately, space is big. The volume in uh, low Earth orbit alone is a million times larger than the volume of all the Earth's oceans, so there's lots of room to move around. Um, but the most important reason to address space traffic is to understand if somebody's doing something sneaky uh, next to your satellite, uh, which happens um, in order to steal data from those satellites, in order to potentially uh, disable that satellite uh, or to modify it in some way. Um, longer term, one of the interests is in manufacturing or combining or modifying objects in orbit so that you could send up payloads that are individually lighter and less fragile. Um, so what do we get from all this stuff in space? We get communications, we get imagery, uh, we get navigation. Those are the most valuable applications. And most of our infrastructure now depends in part on these space-based services, which um, makes uh, us vulnerable in some ways. Um, uh, these objects in space are inherently fragile. They're optimized for weight, so they're very hard to armor. And getting to space is expensive and takes time, so they're hard to replace. Uh, because these objects in space are easy to break with colliding objects or high-powered lasers, they're often easy to jam. Um, protecting these objects or finding ways to quickly replace them has become an important national security priority. Um, there's also a lot of research on trying to find ways of doing some of the things that we currently use space for, um, but instead using ground-based services. So, for example, can we find an alternative to global positioning that doesn't rely on satellites? Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to close um, by talking about a few features of the technology landscape that are important for policy because they're changing quickly. Um, the first is that the technologies are advancing exponentially, um, which makes it difficult for slow policy processes to keep up. Uh, that's already a problem uh, given you know, the rate of progress that we've seen in things like microelectronics uh, over the last few decades or in synthetic biology. But it's possible that that rate of progress could be accelerated even more um, as AI is used to, to automate 
science and engineering itself. Um, if we could achieve a year's worth of scientific discovery in an hours of computing time, uh, that would profoundly change the world. And that, that might actually happen. Um, in fact, a recent example of this is uh, DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of, of Google, uh, applied machine learning to something called the protein folding problem, uh, which is a really hard problem in, uh, in biology to figure out the shape of a protein from its underlying sequence. And decades have been spent on trying to solve this problem um, in some sort of generalizable way. Uh, and AlphaFold, uh, a system that DeepMind developed that just simply uses machine learning and a lot of compute, um, was able to solve a large class of these problems uh, with about a week's worth of, of computing um, and about a, you know, a month's worth of additional coding. So the prospect that we could automate uh, key features of science, engineering, technology development might radically accelerate uh, technology growth over time, um, which will make it even harder than for technology policy to keep up unless we find a way of automating uh, policy at the same time. A second feature uh, that's, I think, important to track of the current technology environment is that the U.S. government is playing a diminishing role. Um, the chart on the top right shows that the U.S. government is now responsible for less than one-third of national R&D spending, um, you know, this down from its height of being responsible for about two thirds of it uh, a few decades ago. And the U.S. as a whole is also diminishing in importance. Uh, as the chart on the bottom right shows, China has caught up with our total level of R&D spending uh, and is probably outspending us for the first time uh, in modern history uh, this year, if not last year. This technology competition with China is going to be one of the most important domains of, of technology and foreign policy. Um, and there's a lot being written about it and being speculated about how the Biden administration will address this competition. How can we compete safely? How can we avoid a race to the bottom on safety and AI and biotech? How can we avoid uh, trade wars that are extremely costly to both sides involving things like export controls. Um, I try to manage my anxiety budget uh, so that I, I don't get an ulcer from every one of these topics. Uh, but the two things that probably most worry me are a loss in strategic stability um, that I mentioned earlier or something like a biotech Chernobyl, um, a lab accident that ends up being disastrous. And I think to avoid either of those outcomes or other outcomes that we'd want to avoid, we'll need good governance um, with people in government, in think tanks, in universities who work to bring technical knowledge and geopolitical knowledge and a goal of balancing competition and safety. Um, on the competitive side, I'm, I'm quite bullish about the U.S. position uh, particularly rel relative to China. Uh, we can't outspend China. I mean, we're, we're going to be a smaller economy uh, than China's, but we can lead China in what are probably the most important dimensions of any technology competition, which is how many smart people can you bring onto your team? Um, there's, a, there's a line attributed to Bill Joy that no matter uh, what company you work for, most of the smartest people work for somebody else. Um, I think it's true that uh, no matter what country you were born in, uh, most of the smartest people were born somewhere else. Um, the world is large. The U.S. population is only 4% of the global population. Uh, China's population is only around 14% of the global population. So most of the people in the world were born somewhere other than the U.S. and China. And part of the competition between the U.S. and China will be about who can bring more talented scientists, engineers, technologists uh, onto their team. And the U.S. is just really good at that. We historically have been really good about attracting the world's 
scientists and engineers when we let them immigrate here. Um, and I, I think uh, the last four years have, have shown that immigration policy can be turned into a magnet pointing the wrong direction uh, when we make it as, as hard as, as possible to immigrate here. But pointed in the wrong direction, it ends up being one of our greatest uh, strategic advantages. Um, our universities also remain the strongest in the world. Um, and with sufficient investment, I think are likely to remain that way. And then the United States also has the benefit of, of true alliances, um, not just transactional relationships, but, um, but friendships in the world that are based on a shared commitment to dem democratic norms, post-enlightenment values. And I think pooling R&D, developing multilateral strategies for technology governance is much easier when those friendships exist. So I'm, I'm not all gloom and doom. Uh, I think it is going to be a, a challenging period ahead of us. Um, but I, I think we can navigate it uh, just by recognizing uh, the strengths that we already have as a nation. And that's it for slides. So now I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And uh, Professor Jordan, I think you're going to uh, help moderate. Yes, I sure will. Um, thank you. That was so interesting. I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I, I really like the breakdown of the different technologies and thinking about some of the strategic implications. So I actually have quite a few questions, but I'm going to um, not take up all the time. And I'm going to turn first to the Q&A that are coming in in the chat because um, we have some great questions. So I am, um, okay, I'm going to, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to Get my Okay, so our first question is from actually one of our aerospace engineering PhD students, uh, Rafael Gradini. Hi, thank you for coming to the talk. Um, he actually has two questions. So his first question is, why doesn't China have the capability of manufacturing high-level chips using ultraviolet, given all of the chips that it does produce? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and there's lots of industry sort of analysis. Um, particularly from the Semiconductor Industry Association, about why is it that China hasn't yet been able to develop its own indigenous equipment? Um, I think part of the reason is these machines are extremely complicated. Um, they cost about $120 million a piece. It, it might be, I don't know, I haven't like, checked this, but I, I think it is, it is up there in the most expensive mass-produced item uh, in, in the world. And each one of them weighs about 100 million, 100 uh, tons. Each one of them is um, made up of tens of thousands of components, which are sourced from uh, from leading edge manufacturers that so far have not agreed to share that technology uh, with China, um, including things like advanced lasers and and optics. So part of it is. Uh, supply chain control, and part of it is just the degree of precision machining that's required that so far China has not um, has not built up. Uh, so it's likely to be some years before they could um, indigenously produce an extremely ultraviolet, ultraviolet uh, lithography tool um, or even a um, immersion lithography tool of, of the sort that's, uh, that's used today. Um, great. Our next question is also from Raphael, so we're going to just get get this get, get both of these on the table because they're great questions. Um, what about the distribution of capabilities from monolithic assets to smaller cube sets? Cube sets granted some physical limitations, but do you see this trend as happening? Yeah, it's a, a great question. I think we are seeing this. We're seeing some really creative approaches to creating distributed apertures. Um, I mean. If you're thinking about optics, you don't you don't need to sample the photons all on one you know continuous aperture. You could have a distributed aperture in which you're sampling from those photons in a few different places or a bunch of different places. The main thing there is that the the objects from which you're sampling need to know where they are relative to each other and relative to the objects uh, that they're imaging, and that ends up being a really hard hard problem. Uh, but there are a lot of really creative uh, approaches to solve that problem. Great. Um, our next question is from another aerospace engineering student, Mark Mulberg. Hi, Mark. Um, and he asked, with the increasing role of private entities and bi that bi private entities and businesses play in funding technology development, do you see or expect an impact on how security critical technology proliferates internationally? Yeah. Uh, 
yes. I mean, we're, we're seeing this right now, which is um, industry and governments don't agree about which technologies are considered sensitive, which pose proliferation risks. Uh, I mean, one example of this is a few years ago, the United States got very nervous about uh, DNA synthesizers as being something that would be shared globally, and uh, industry felt differently. They were looking forward to selling those machines um, and, and fought hard against regulation. Um, so it's, uh, it's a battle because there's enormous amounts spent on lobbying to prevent you know, export controls or um, other restrictions on the sale of technologies that pose proliferation risks. Another example actually would be um, an isotope separation. Um, so laser enrichment technologies that could make isotope separation for nuclear weapons development much cheaper and also much less visible, making treaty verification much harder, um, is something that industry has tried um, to be able to successfully market uh, despite the protests of, of government. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a constant struggle. Great. Um, oh, we actually had a comment about um, sharing slides and a reading list. So perhaps I'll follow up with you on that after the talk, and, and maybe we can, you know, get some interesting literature to, uh, to, to send around to the participants. Um, let's see. Oh, Happy we have to a do that. One, one reading recommendation, by the way, I, I, I just read recently, and it, um, I found it riveting and terrifying, is a book called The Precipice uh, by Toby Ord, uh, which talks about some of the risks from emerging technologies, as well as policy options of addressing them. I thought it was a fantastic read. Great. Just wrote that down. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, our next question is from Daryl Zeth. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Can you talk a bit about the role of CSET? How is it funded and supported? What is your vision for its impact? Yeah, so CSET is uh, this think tank that we created at, at Georgetown a couple of years ago. And it's sort of like an open source intelligence cell trying to understand global developments in technology, um, how they affect international security. Uh, and it takes a very data-based approach. We have a large number of data scientists, um, statisticians, uh, economists, uh, uh, software engineers who help us analyze large data sets, publication data, patent data, investment data at scale, um, often in other languages. We, we do a lot of uh, uh, Chinese translation work. Um, and then supported by a group of, of policy analysts so this merger of sort of data science and policy analysis to make sense of, of trends in global technologies. Uh, we do a lot of analysis of global supply chains in those technologies, particularly in AI and computing, but also now starting a, a, a large project on biotech. Um, and the, the goal really is to advise, um, especially U.S. policymakers on these trends and technology that are going to be relevant to security. Uh, you can learn more at our website cset.georgetown.edu. Great. Um, sorry, I was just scrolling through the questions. Um, okay, we have a question from one of our INTA, our INTA PhD student, Captain Mike Chechi, and he asks, do you see the growing role of commercial companies in space as inherently destabilizing, and how can the U.S. government best leverage their advances? Yeah, I um, I think there's so there's there's some aspects of the democratization or even commercialization of of space um, that could be destabilizing um, in that there are sort of surprise entrants um, to being able to get space based capabilities that you wouldn't have um, have expected. Uh, but I think overall it's probably stabilizing in part because it's now just really hard to hide stuff um, on the planet. And um, I think it takes us out of this sort of chain of suspicion of, you know, hidden programs when the entire Earth's surface can be, you know, imaged um, in real time and be imaged in such a way that everybody knows, like everybody has access to the same information uh, because it's now commercially available. Um, I think that's it's just a really interesting change in, um, in the in kind of effects of a variety of security dilemmas. 
um, because it's not just the U.S. intelligence community that's, you know, speculating about whether there's a ballistic missile program in a particular country. It could be, it could be you all. I mean, you could be, you know, doing your own sort of open source intel work, looking at commercial overhead imagery and analyzing it. And we've seen some amazing work coming out of universities and think tanks doing analysis that wouldn't have, have been possible even for intelligence agencies um, a few years ago. So my, my hope is that the net effect of that uh, increases strategic stability. Uh, but I mean, one, one um, could definitely argue the other side. You know, I'm actually going to take my moderator privilege and ask a question of my own because it sort of roughly ties into this issue of strategic stability, but also more touches on the question of governance, which you brought up in the beginning of your talk, which is something I'm, I'm find really interesting in these new technologies. And so I've often thought about, you know, this sort of like, um, you know, patchwork nature of the cybersecurity response infrastructure, right? And that you have all of these stakeholders and all of these agencies and a lot of coordination problems that result from, you know, a kind of lack of clear response or, or, or sort of system of responding to these particular um, threats or, you know, possible threats. And so I wonder if you see this as being an issue for some of these other technologies, this kind of, you know, broadly thinking about emerging technologies and kind of, is there sort of a patchwork system? I mean, are there, it seems that there are some challenges in, in governance and in, you know, uh, bureaucratic ways of addressing these particular threats. And if you see any, any, any possibility for, you know, kind of um, threats to strategic stability in that regard, right? Just even on, on that level, on the kind of government response level. Yeah, I, I think I think your observation is right, not only about cyber, but a lot of these other emerging technologies and that it is a patchwork. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have an office of technology strategy in the government uh, that, that's coordinating this uh, across, um, across all of the federal agencies. Um, we, you know, we're starting to do that with cyber. I mean, I think the creation of a national cyber director um, at the White House uh, sort of goes towards that. And I think we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to do that w around sort of emerging tech more broadly. The creation of a senior director for technology at the National Security Council, um, which is led by uh, my friend and, and former colleague, Turin Shabra, who was at, at CSET for, uh, for two years before he went there, is I think one of the, the first parts of an effort um, to have a harmonized technology strategy, but it crosses so many different aspects of policy from you know, export controls, investment screening, R&D funding, um, STEM immigration policy, and getting all of those in sync is, is really hard. Um, so I, I think it, it's one of the biggest challenges for the US government is figuring out um, how to harmonize all of this. Thank you. I have a couple other questions, but I won't dominate, so I'll, I'll turn over to our, our uh, questions in the Q&A function here. Um, Chandler Thornhill, one of our students, has asked, perhaps the largest, uh, the largest bottleneck in intelligence isn't in gathering, but in information processing. Do you see AI quantum computing as a solution to this, or do these technologies mean greater data generation, leading us back to where we started? Yeah, I'm optimistic about um, about AI increasingly being used to, to make smarter decisions about what we collect. Um, there's, in the intelligence community, there's been some exploration of this idea called model-based collection, in which you, you use uh, an AI system to make better decisions about what the, the intelligence collection systems, you know, things like satellites um, or intercepted communications um, or human intelligence even, are ultimately tasked to collect because those are really expensive decisions. Like if you're if you're retasking a satellite to move into a different position, that's really costly in terms of fuel. You can't do it that many times in the life of a of a satellite. Um, so each one of those decisions might end up costing you the equivalent of millions of dollars. You want to make sure that you're making the right decisions about what to collect. Um, and I think AI is starting to help us there. Um, it's also starting to help us with um, with what kinds of projects are worth data mining. Um, so we're seeing, you know, efforts at places like Google to think, what is the part of this data set that in fact is most important to analyze? Are there features of data that we can characterize in advance so that we don't need to train over the entire data set, we only need to train over the subsample? Um, so I think that will increasingly be important as we develop better AI systems. 
you. Um, Allison Mercer has asked, uh, thank you so much for your time this morning. Great talk. Where does the U.S. need to focus in order to continue to foster our strategic advantage and attracting talent? What do we need to change? What should we not change? Yeah, I think this is one of those where we already have the talent, and it's just that we've been, like, tying kryptonite around our neck. Um, I mean, especially in the last four years, um, there's just been a, a lot of rolling back of, of U.S. immigration policy that has prevented scientists and engineers from, from joining us um, from other countries. And, you know, I'm not a particularly partisan person, um, but I just think about this strategically. Uh, like, I want to have as many smart scientists and engineers on our team. And to maximize that, like, let's make use of the immigration policy that we already have that allows us uh, to attract and retain talent. Uh, let's not like turn off those policies. Um, if we want to do more to strengthen those policies, there are a few things. I mean, one is just speeding up uh, the pathway uh, to permanent residency, speeding up the green card process, um, not over relying on H-1B as something to fix everything, um, doing uh, more of the entrepreneurial visas that can um, bring in new talent, um, removing the visa caps by, uh, by country and the green card caps by country. Over half of the people on employment-based green card wait lists um, are from India, um, but we've capped the country at 7%, and that's, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, both demographically and in terms of uh, talent that could be contributing to our economy. Um, over half of the founders of $1 billion plus tech companies in the United States uh, are foreign born. Over half of the computer scientists and mathematicians in Silicon Valley that are contributing to our economy are foreign born. I, I think this is one of the most important um, features of our economy. And we, we just have to play the cards that we've been lucky to get, which is that lots of smart people want to be American. That's great. You know, this actually, I'm going to ask a, a, a sort of related question, you know, that I've, I've been thinking recently about, you know, the role of science diplomacy and, and, and you know, as, as a way to think about the future of U.S.-China relationships, right, and trying to identify areas of collaboration and cooperation, you know, particularly in the science domain. Um, but then, you know, after listening to your talk and we're thinking about, you know, great power competition, it seems that this is really now the area of great power competition, right, in these new technologies, which is a fundamentally different model than, you know, we were sort of thinking about great power competition in the Cold War, for instance. So, so then does that make collaboration less or less, you know, um, you know, it, 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 dan more, more dangerous, perhaps, right? Like more risky. Um, and, and I guess that is related to this idea of, you know, bringing in scientists, bringing in people, bringing in students, right? Because that's all about, re you know, collaboration and diplomacy. So I guess I just kind of think, what does this mean for the sort of the great, the future of like great power competition and the ability for cooperation or collaboration, right? Are we just like doomed for more, you know, uh, <laughs> more competition. I, I think that we can find really important areas to collaborate on with, with China and, and with Russia. And we have to. Uh, I mean, the world depends on finding those areas. Even during the height of, of the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union, we had space cooperation program with Apollo Soyuz. Um, we had uh, we had, you know, various efforts at, at um, reducing proliferation risks uh, together. Uh, we had forms of scientific cooperation, even when they had sort of security safeguards. There's this really interesting example of a, um, of a supercomputer being sent uh, to Moscow and guarded by um, a military officer to make sure that it wasn't being used for nuclear simulations for, you know, warhead design, but was instead being used for scientific computing. So we've, we've tried, you know, we've, we have some examples that we can pull this off. I think right now what's really important is cooperation on clean tech, uh, cooperation on climate, uh, mm -hmm. cooperation on some of these transnational issues like public health or um, pandemics. Uh, and I think that space is also another area where there's lots of important symbolic cooperation. I think, you know, restoring something like Apollo Soyuz 
um, for today is a really exciting thing to explore with both China and Russia. Great, thank you. Um, all right, we have time for a few more questions. So our next question um, gets touches back to the issue of governance. Richard Hester asks, academic consideration of the security implications of emerging technologies has been around for quite a while, since at least the early days after the A-bomb. You've mentioned governance a few times. How do we move towards sustained government uh, institutional focus on these topics? Yeah, I, th I think it's partly structure and partly personnel. So on the structure side, you know, figuring out who, who owns this as a problem within the federal government. Um, and it seems like it's some combination of National Security Council, Office of Science, Technology, Policy, and National Economic Council. So how do you create sort of the, the policy structure in, in which you can guide and coordinate the efforts at, at the agencies? And I think that's, that's starting to be built up. Uh, the personnel side, though, is just as essential, if not more essential. How do you bring on board into policy roles the people who have sufficient understanding of the technology, the policy levers, the geopolitical environment, in which to make wise decisions? We don't make it easy for people to come into the federal government. I mean, particularly in the national security community, the security clearance process is just incredibly you know, painful. It, it has uh, a real deterring effect on people who are interested in joining. We also don't make it easy for people to move laterally um, or to come into the government for a little while and then go back out. Or And, you know, that's much more typical for technology um, experts. They're not expecting to stay at a place for 10 years. They might expect to stay at a place for two years. So we really need to reform our personnel policies to make it easier to attract technical talent and to key policy roles. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Although before we get there, I actually wanted to, um, uh, Hoshik uh, Lee posted in the chat um, and gave a little plug for one of our, uh, one of my colleagues' courses. Uh, Dr. Borowitz teaches a great course on space security. Um, and it is indeed a very uh, interesting and thought-provoking course. So, um, so for those of you interested, uh, check out uh, Dr. Borowitz's course. Um, let's see, our next question is about export controls. Uh, by Ron Bolander asks, how should export controls for emerging technologies be fashioned given the degree of specificity in existing regulations that may be difficult to emulate for less certain emerging technologies? Do we need a new regime of controls for emerging technology? Yeah, one of the interesting experiences I've had over the last couple of years has been on the advisory board for export controls. And so I, I see the list of you know hundreds of technologies that are added to you know being controlled and i think we do need a new regime because i think just simply having thousands upon thousands of technologies that we've deemed as sensitive is not going to help us unless we understand how those technologies are used together or what the future of those technologies looks like um, bob gates the former uh, secretary of defense um, and former director of cia said what we need is um, is a small yard with a high fence. We need to decide what are the small number of core foundational technologies uh, that we're going to protect at, at a much higher level. Because right now, having thousands upon thousands of technologies means we, we don't really invest that much in protecting any one of them. Um, as one example, I mean, I do think the, those extreme ultraviolet lithography tools are among the most important technologies on the planet right now. If you want to prevent the sort of decoupling of global supply chains, because um, I think China's intent really is to become completely self-sufficient, if you want to ensure that we still have an integrated global economy, you might decide you're going to spend a lot of effort on controlling those machines um, and much less effort in controlling, you know, the thousands of components. Um, so I, I think there's some really important strategic questions that we have to ask about export controls. I'm really glad you raised it. It's like a, um, sort of a, a, um, a, a like kind of nerdy topic that ends up being really important. There was a great piece actually just today in the Wall Street Journal about how export controls are getting more attention as a policy issue probably now than they ever have been. Um, and uh, it's time for reform. Thank you. Um, and actually, before we close, uh, I'm sorry, I missed Dr. Rubin also posted in the chat. Um, 
about a uh, special issue that came out, <coughs> excuse me, in Orbis on emerging technology and national security, and it covers a lot of the technologies talked about today, AI, satellites, bio, CRISPR, things like that. So you might want to check that out. That's in the chat as well. Um, thank you so much for this really, really important and thought-provoking talk. And um, I think we could have gone on for a lot longer, but we are out of time. Um, so thank you, Dr. Matheny, for joining us. It was really terrific having you here, and uh, we really appreciate your time and expertise. Thanks, Professor Jordan, and thanks for all the great questions. Those were awesome. Thank you, everyone, Take for care. attending. Bye. Bye.